In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to name your sins to God so that you might be in fellowship. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word this evening. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word of God into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, verse 34. Matthew chapter 9, verse 34. And we start out in Matthew chapter 9, verse 34 with a conjunction called but. Now in Matthew chapter 9 verse 31 as we studied earlier we also had a conjunction called but and that but in 931 well there's a link between 931 and 934 with that conjunction and that's because Jesus told the uh, people the blind people whom he had healed do not go out and tell everyone about it just go to the priest don't bother trying to evangelize all of Capernaum and he said this because all of Capernaum was pretty much negative. There were a few people who would come around to the gospel. And what he was trying to do was tell them, look, don't go around and tell them how you were healed. Go, don't go around and tell them about me because most of these people are negative and you don't have enough information to tell them about me and therefore it will result in criticism of you and people will lambaste you. And, and this is where the two buts come together because in 934 it says, but they went anyway. They did it anyway. Well, they were excited. We can understand that. They had been blind and now they could see. So they got excited and they started uh, jumping around, probably shouting hallelujah, and walked down the street and said, Jesus healed me. Jesus healed me. Now, that might have been all they really recognized was that miracle. Now, they were saved. Uh, but they might have not had enough information to go up to someone and say, believe in Christ. He is your Savior. He's the one who was to come. Look at prophecy. And prophecy said that he would come here and heal the blind and the leper and all of these things. So it's time you believe in him. But they didn't have enough information to do that. So our Lord in 931 said, don't do it. Don't go out and give the gospel. And it's the same for brand new believers. And a lot of brand new believers get fired up. It's understandable. For the first time ever, they've believed in Christ. They know they're going to heaven. And so they want to go out and tell the whole world about it. Well, as a brand new believer, you really should wait until you get more information. And that's because, uh, well, you don't want heresies to start to arise. Because a brand new be believer... Uh, knowing that he was saved by faith alone in Christ alone, a little later down the line, he might just start to say something like in his fervor, in emotional fervor, he might say, invite Christ into your heart. And that's where we get a lot of the stuff today is because a lot of baby believers run around thinking they know enough to give the gospel. You got to know a little bit before you give it. So these two buts are in conjunction. And then in 934, this is why he said, don't do it. He told the new believers, don't go out and tell them that I've healed you. Go straight to the priest because they know something of scripture and maybe you can convince them because you have been healed of such and such. Uh, but even they weren't going to uh, respond. A few of them did. But in 934 it says, but the Pharisees said, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. You see, the Pharisees became very jealous of our Lord. They were taking away their, the people they talked to. You could call it a congregation, but they had synagogues. And uh, they started to follow the Lord. And some of those peoples would leave their synagogues and go to the Lord, and they would get jealous. And they would say, I don't like that at all. So what we need to do is uh, make up a story about our Lord and say, well, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. In other words, he is under Satan, either Satan possession or Satan influence to where Satan was doing this on his behalf. And they only said this because they were jealous and they did not want our Lord to continue to spread this message throughout Capernaum. And even though Capernaum was a place where not many people were positive toward the word, they still didn't want this man to go around and mess with their ministry. That's, they looked at it as a threat. They looked out at Jesus and said, this man is a threat to my ministry. We must destroy him. We must say anything vicious we can about him to keep him from taking our positions. They became jealous 
and they became very protective of themselves. And and that's human nature, the sin nature anyway. And then in 935, it says, then Jesus. This is funny because they're trying to keep Jesus out of the synagogues. They're trying to keep Jesus out of their towns and their villages. They thought of it as their town. They thought of it as their village. And they're trying to keep Jesus out. But what does Jesus do? Then Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues. Well, he would just walk right up into the temple and up into one of their synagogues and start teaching right there where they had been teaching before. You can understand now why Jesus was so hated because he just suddenly walks into their place where they have always taught the law and they were always regarded as very spiritual. And he just walks up and he starts teaching right in the place of them, even though they were so jealous and bitter. Well, this shows that uh, Jesus was not a man to be intimidated. He was not intimidated by these religious nuts and he just walked right up And he started preaching. No intimidation of religion. No intimidation from all of those people. I'm going to keep doing what I was sent here to do is what our Lord said. So what did he do? Heralded the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and sickness. Now, the heralding of the gospel of the kingdom, of course, he was telling them to believe in him. But then when he started healing people of diseases and sicknesses, he was doing something that the scribes and the Pharisees could not do. And they, their blood started to boil because, uh, well, who, who are the people going to follow? Are they going to follow someone who gets up and has sweet platitudes and gives a verse here and there and says, follow this law and follow that law? And then they see some man get up and just start healing people? Well, it's a lot more. Well, you can see what happened. They became very jealous and very angry. How dare you walk into my synagogue and stand up and heal people under the name of Satan, which is what they accused him of. But he wasn't doing that, of course. So what we see here is the fact that the criticism of the religious crowds never stopped Jesus. He wasn't intimidated. He didn't care. He had a mission to follow. And it was a mission that God the Father had given him and he was going to complete it despite all of the things that were going to come his way. And despite they would call him a drunkard, despite the fact they would call him someone who slept with prostitutes, despite the fact that they would call him somebody who would uh, associate with tax collectors. That doesn't have much implication today, but back then that was a huge implication of Well, they would want to destroy him for that. The tax collectors had authority over the Jewish people and they hated the authority of the Roman Empire and uh, they would go around and collect taxes, even skim a little off the top for themselves. And the tax collectors usually uh, turned out to be pretty wealthy because when they went and taxed the people, they would take a chunk for themselves. The Roman Empire permitted it because they knew that if uh, the tax collectors could enrich themselves at the same time, they would enrich the Roman Empire. So they just, uh, well, they they knew it wasn't ethical, but they just uh, turned their head, as it were, and said, well, they got to do it because we need the money and they need it too, so let them do it. And so the tax collectors were hated, yet that's who Jesus hung around, and they all used that against him. But we'll see that it really didn't have to do with the lifestyle of Jesus in the next message, because we'll see that they criticized John the Baptist just the same. And John the Baptist never took one drink of wine. He never hung around tax collectors. He never hung around prostitutes. He was out in the middle of a desert by himself, And he didn't even do all of these socially unacceptable things that the religious people thought were socially unacceptable. Yet they criticized him too. So it's not a matter of personality. It's a matter of the message. And that's what we're going to get uh, the point across here uh, through all of these verses. Doesn't matter that Jesus drank. Doesn't matter that Jesus hung around with tax collectors. Doesn't matter that Jesus hung around with the nefarious people of the day. He was giving them the gospel. So he didn't care and he did it anyway and he was criticized. But he would have been criticized whether he had that personality or a different kind of personality. 936. Now this is uh, something that occurs here. Now this is his ministry to the disciples. And we start to uh, get a glimpse of his ministry to the disciples because this is a type of parenthetical type thing. It's parenthetical because uh, what uh, Christ is saying is Uh, I didn't do this ministry all on my own. 
What he's saying is, I didn't uh, come out here. There's no way he could have did it all on his own, even though he was the son of God. What he's saying is, I had people helping me. The disciples, they knew enough doctrine where they could go out and help me out in this ministry. And he had people helping him behind the scenes. And so this is like a parenthesis. And it's our Lord saying, look, this ministry too goes to the disciples. And it's not just me all the time. The disciples go behind the scenes and help out all the time. And while they may never get praised for it, well, this is the parentheses. This is a t- this is a way in which our Lord uh, on the side praised the disciples. You see, he had been ripping them apart before, telling them what idiots they were with little faith, and he would rip them apart constantly. And now he's uh, well, he's putting a little parenthesis aside and saying, "Look, these are my disciples. They stick with me all the time, and they're going to help me out in this. And it's not all me, even though he is the Son of God." He needed to have people with other gifts to help him out. The same holds true for a local church. If the pastor has no one behind him, it falls. Even if the pastor's right or if he's wrong, it doesn't matter. If no one's sticking to him, it falls apart. So, and Jesus uh, makes this point from 936 onward. 936, when he saw the crowds, he had a reasonable sympathy. This is straight from the corrected translation. I will not go into the Greek or Aramaic on this. I'll just give it to you uh, the way it is uh, corrected. And if you have any question about it, you can look it up on your own. It'll take you a lifetime. But when he and the crowds... When he saw the crowds, he had a reasonable sympathy for them because they were devoid of divine viewpoint, attitude, and were scattered. Now, this word scattered originally meant to hit the ground due to inebriation. That's what scattered meant. Uh, But here it means that they weren't able to mentally take in doctrine because of their negativity at God consciousness. You see, that they came to a point of God consciousness just like like all of we do. And we might come to God consciousness at the age of uh, 10. I did at the age of about 4 or 5, and you may too. Others, if you live in a culture like in Africa, it might take until you're 12 years old to reach God consciousness. And some people who are morons and born that way never get to God consciousness, and they automatically go to heaven upon their death. But for all of us, we reach a point of God consciousness. We reach a point of time in which we look toward the heavens and see all the stars, and we say, where did all this come from? And then we say to ourselves, there must be a God. And so that is the point of God consciousness. Now, just because you become God conscious doesn't mean you're going to accept the gospel of Christ. So these people knew there was a God, but they didn't know Jesus Christ was the son of God. And these people would be scattered because they were negative. They didn't care to learn about the gospel of Christ. They were negative at God consciousness. And the reason why is because they were in a religious area, Capernaum a religious area, a place where religion thrived, and wherever religion thrives, grace does not. That is, unless there's a breakthrough. And Jesus Christ is trying to make a breakthrough in this religious area. It's phenomenal how much time he spent in Capernaum, a place where people hated him. Yet he stayed there and stuck with it until he was called to another place. And he stayed there because he knew these people need to be shocked out of their religion. So we need to take some points on religion, and that's because, well, Jesus Christ is presenting himself to religious people. People who have, well, they've already uh, decided in them, and they've already decided themselves, we're holy enough. We don't need a savior. That's what they say to themselves. And then Christ comes along. This is why he's been so tough lately. This is why he's been ripping people to shreds lately, is because he's been dealing with religious people. Now, point one, religion is man seeking the approval of God through his own works. Religion is man seeking the approval of God through his own works. And this is what all the people in Capernaum were trying to do, seeking God through their own works. If they just follow the Mosaic law, they'll be all right. If they're just a good father to their children, if they're just a good husband to their wives, if they follow the Mosaic law, then surely God would approve of them. That's religion. That's not true. There are a lot of unbelievers who treat their children and their spouses better than believers do. 
And that's not the issue. But religion makes it the issue. So religion is man seeking the approval of God through his own works. Point two, Christianity is God seeking man through the work of Christ on the cross. Christianity is God seeking man. It's God seeking us. In religion, people seek God. In Christianity, God seeks us. That's why God calls us to salvation. That's why we don't invite Him and He invites us. So Christianity is God seeking man through the work of Christ on the cross. That's also found in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it makes it very clear. It's not on the basis of our works. Isaiah 64, 6 says that all of our righteous deeds are as filthy garments. In the Hebrew it says all of our righteous deeds are as menstrual rags. Makes it even more disgusting, but that's what they are. And that's how it comes out in the Hebrew. So Christianity is God seeking man through the work of Christ on the cross. Point three, religion is the devil's ace trump. Religion is how the devil clouds the way of salvation. It's also how he clouds the way of our Christian way of life. And we walk away thinking our Christian way of life is to do good deeds, to do good works, to be good. Well, how do you be good? There's a way to have divine good of intrinsic value, and that is through the protocol plan, but not through all of this religion not through all of these human works and human sacrifices, asceticism. People give up things thinking that that will uh, please God. And they think the Christian way of life is to give up smoking, to give up drinking, to give up chewing, to give up all of these things that aren't even listed in Scripture. And they think that's the Christian way of life. And it's not. It's not even close. Anything an unbeliever can do is not the Christian way of life. Think about that for a moment. The unbeliever can stop smoking. Does that, make, does that mean that since he stopped smoking, he's living the Christian way of life? No, he's an unbeliever. An unbeliever can stop drinking. Now, I'm not advocating drunkenness. Not at all. And drunkenness would take you out of the spirit. You'd be filled with the spirits and not the spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's what drunkenness is all about. But uh, it's a sin and you rebound and you keep moving if you're a believer. But an unbeliever can say, I'll never drink again, never touch a drop. Well, so what? You're still bound for hell unless you believe in Christ. Now, that's not to, th that's not to say that no one needs to have a lifestyle change when they believe in Christ. Uh, uh, you do, probably, most likely. And that lifestyle change comes from post-salvation, epistemological rehabilitation. It comes from learning the Word of God, not from some change of behavior in human energy. This is all spiritual, a divine energy, a divine power, something far above and beyond what we could ever do. Yet it's hard for religious people to break from that because when you say in yourself, I'll stop doing this, you're giving credit to yourself. And all the credit goes to God, and religion always gives credit to man, which means religion is arrogance. Christianity is based on humility, not arrogance. And it's antithetical. So religion is the devil's ace trump because it's antithetical to Christianity. That means opposite of. And if you have to write a report in school, uh, well, write this word down, antithetical, A-N-T-I-T-H-E-C-T-I-C-A-L. Anti, well, did I spell it wrong? A-N-T-I, antithetical, T-H-E-C-I, what? What is it? Usually I have to write it down. Anyway, after class, meet with her and get the <laughs> correct spelling and get the correct spelling of antithetical. And when you have to write a report on a book that you haven't read yet, just throw in the word antithetical. You'll probably get a few points for it anyway. And just say, this book is opposite of this book over here. But use antithetical, which means opposite, and the teacher will smile upon you or say you've cheated. <laughs> Either way, just say, no, I learned a vocabulary word and used it in my English uh, literature class, and therefore I know it. And you can tell them, antithetical means opposite. Give me my points. <laughs> so then point four, religion acts as a veil over the face. Religion acts as a veil over the face. And it acts as a veil for those who have already believed 
and it acts as a veil for those who haven't believed. It clouds the way of salvation. Religion clouds the way of salvation. And you say to yourself, why does everyone around here teach invite Christ into your heart? Why does everyone around here teach lordship salvation? Why does everyone around here teach that it's by works that you're saved? Well, it's religion. And it veils the way of salvation. Also, in the Christian way of life, you may have believed in Christ. And then someone comes along and says, all you do at Bible Doctrine Church is sit on your butts and listen to the Word. Why aren't you getting out and working for the Lord? Well, they're trying to introduce religion, religion into the Christian way of life. And it doesn't work. But it's the devil's ace trump because it sounds so nice. And why does it sound nice? Because it appeals to your arrogance. Because you can say, I did something today. But when you're living in the Christian way of life, you always say, Christ did something a long time ago. And I'm just following in his footsteps. And you have to take yourself out of the equation and leave yourself on the mercy of grace. And it's hard for people to do because they've been raised to think that it's them. It's what they do. It's how great they are. And this is why Matthew gets so tough. It's so tough for some people. And I told you when I started, Matthew, that this would weed out legalism. If there was any, anyone here, never accused anyone of it, but if there's anyone here who ever had an inkling toward legalism, they would, re, they would either react to what is going to happen in Matthew or they're going to respond to it. And it might take them a while to respond until eventually they say, yeah, that's right, it's all about grace. Because right here, what they do is they suddenly see Jesus Christ ripping them to shreds and they take it personally. And they see, they see Jesus Christ uh, ripping apart these religious people and they get shocked. And we'll see all of this very soon because it gets rougher and tougher. And our Lord gets tougher because, well, he's seeing that he's not getting through to the people in Capernaum. So what does he do? He gets harsher with them, tougher, stronger. He doesn't lighten up thinking he'll bring them along. They're sealed. Their consciousness, their consciousnesses are about to be sealed with religion. And you have to break through religion with a fist, not with a soft a glove, but with a fist. And so we have point a five, religion appeals to the arrogance of man, making it hard for a religious person veiled by arrogance to let go of what he sees as his own human ability to save himself. Religion appeals to the arrogance of man, making it hard for a religious person veiled by arrogance to let go of what he sees as his own human ability to save himself. Now I understand there's a few churches around here who might teach uh, grace as the means of salvation. And, and people, uh, lots of people around here are saved in that environment. But once they're saved, well they go straight back to religion, covenant theology. And they go straight back to don't mow your lawn on Sunday. And don't do this and don't do that. Weighing people down with heavy loads of burden. But that's not the Christian way of life. We were saved by grace, so a fortiori, with stronger reason, we live by grace. And that is how it works. And it's good that people get saved because they're not going to hell. But it's terrible when they go the way of religion. But it's happened since uh, the Apostle Paul was around. Every time he went out to teach grace, a whole group of people would come right up behind him and try and... and uh, all of a sudden, they were strong on grace to start with. Now, all of a sudden, idiotic men are circum circumcising themselves and going through a lot of pain and asceticism and self-sacrifice, completely rejecting the post-salvation spiritual life. Point six, Christ had reasonable sympathy. This is what we get from 936. Christ had reasonable sympathy for them because he could foresee uh, two different things. Our Lord could foresee that Israel's about to go under the fifth cycle of discipline. And he could foresee that when he went to a place like Capernaum and met such resistance, he could see that the fifth cycle of discipline was drawing nigh. And they weren't going to listen to his message of grace. Secondly, he could see them at the last judgment in which he has to cast them out personally into outer darkness and where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. 
And no one wants that for anyone, including Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And God the Father's will is for all of us to believe because God the Father doesn't want to see any of us end up in a place where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. But it occurs because of volition. So he saw these things coming. So he had reasonable sympathy. It would be like uh, looking over this land today and you say to yourself, man... It's about to go under, I can tell. No one really cares for the word, I can tell. And guess what? We have sympathy for it. We might even cry about it as the Apostle Paul did when people wouldn't get with the word. And we might uh, go back and reminisce, look at September 11th, and know that it's going to be seven times worse when the next cycle comes along. And we might say to ourselves, that's horrible, I sympathize. Well, you can sympathize, but it's not going to stop what's going to happen. And even Christ sympathized, but he, he, not even he himself as the Son of God could stop it because he has to follow his own integrity. And when people rejected him, he has to say it was their choice, even though he loved the Israelites and he wanted them to continue as a client nation. And he, if it were up to him, he would have come down and brought the millennium. But you see, as per the angelic conflict, they had volition. And they had to make their own choice. And really, what we have here in Matthew is a choice for them. All of you, or most of you, accept me and believe in me and get with the word of God and we'll go straight into the millennium together. And then I will come with power and show you that the Romans have no power over you. But they didn't do that. They did like we do today and say, Ah, fooey, I'll get with it later. Or, I won't get with it at all, I don't like it, or whatever. And that's, that's human volition, freedom. And we can't force people into it. And that would be, well, we would be no different than a religious person if we were to try to force someone. Because what do religious people do? Always force stuff on other people. We are under grace. And while we might present the gospel to people, we can't hold a sword to their throat and say, accept it. And while we might present a doctrine to people who don't want it, you can't hold a sword to their throat and say, eat it. It's up to them. And Jesus saw this and had sympathy because he knew, well, this is Jesus having a sense of helplessness, saying, look, these people have rejected me. I feel sorry for them. And he went on. So then he said to his disciples, you see, he's looking out at this great, throng of people in 937 so then he said to his disciples the harvest is great well there's a lot of people out there needing the gospel but the workers are few and what he means by workers when he says workers he's talking about skilled workers people who can present the gospel and a lot of pastors today might call themselves workers but they can't even get the gospel straight and if you can't get the gospel straight you're not a worker you're hindering the project. It's like a carpenter who knows nothing about anything. And they start uh, throwing up boards all hodgepodge everywhere. You're not going to get anything except a thing that's about to fall over. But what our Lord wanted was skilled workers. That's why he's talking to the disciples. Because the disciples thus far have been able to take the insults. They've been able to listen to the instruction of the Lord and they've moved on and started to grow a little bit. So what he's telling them is, look, you're going to be the skilled workers and we need them. We need you. So this is the parenthesis in which he went from cast, uh, cast, uh, whatever, uh, destroy, not destroying them, but constantly uh, castigating them, constantly telling them what idiots and nitwits they were. Well, he goes from that mode of attack. Now he goes to this and is saying, look, I need you to be skilled workers. And he goes from type, a type of insult. Our Lord didn't purposely insult them. It was just to wake them up to the importance of it all. And then he would be soft on them occasionally and say, I need you to be a skilled worker in my harvest. So this is a reference, and we'll just take one point out of 937. This is a reference to skilled workers. The harvest is great refers to all the people who have never heard the gospel. The workers are few refers to the fact that there are very few capable of giving the gospel correctly. And the same holds true today. Very few are capable of giving the gospel correctly. 938. So ask the Lord of the harvest. Who is the Lord of the harvest? 
God the Holy Spirit is the Lord of the harvest, but we must be careful in interpreting this because we never pray, remember, to God the Holy Spirit. All of our prayers are always addressed to God the Father. This is in a passive voice. And this means that, well, he's saying, pray to God the Father that God the Holy Spirit will direct you to people who need the gospel. That is what it's saying. It's not telling you to ask the Lord of the harvest directly. The Lord of the harvest is the Holy Spirit. He's the one who always has common and efficacious grace. He's the one that reveals the gospel message to the spiritually dead and makes it understandable. And he's the one who makes it efficacious for salvation when they have faith alone in Christ alone. So God the Holy Spirit has common and efficacious grace. And so what we pray is to God the Father. And this is what it means. And it's a legitimate prayer. It's a legitimate prayer that we would ask God to open the doors for us to witness accurately when it comes to those who are seeking the gospel. And you might pray just the way I pray nearly every night when I decide to pray in this manner. And you pray, Father, if there's anyone in my vicinity that is willing to listen to the gospel of Christ, send them to me and I'll give them the gospel as a worker of the harvest, as a worker in the harvest. And then God the Holy Spirit will uh, send that person to you whom, who wants it and then they get common grace and they understand it. And then they get a chance to believe it. Sometimes they believe it, sometimes they won't, but it's no skin off your back. It's, uh, it's, it's really dependent upon them. So either they're, they're, they will accept it or reject it. So ask the Lord of the harvest, God the Holy Spirit, to send out workers into the harvest. And I described to you exactly how to pray in that manner, which would be legitimate. And I've prayed it before, and I've had doors open to my friends. I had one friend in high school who was a genius, still is a genius. He's still alive as far as I know. I saw him at the airport a couple months ago. And uh, he, a genius, and I gave him the gospel. And it was a time for him to hear the gospel. And he understood it. I could tell he understood it because it bothered him. And then he rejected it. And uh, now he's a flaming atheist. Well, that's the way it goes. And not all the time, God the Holy Spirit might send to you someone who will listen to it and get to understand it. But you see what happens is when they go to the last judgment, they'll come up with all kinds of excuses. And he will say, you were told the way of salvation and you rejected it. So to hell you go. And that's where they go. And so uh, oftentimes we'll pray these prayers and some people will come along who won't believe. But it's not a time to fall all apart. It's a time to just uh, respect freedom and say you have a choice and have sympathy at the same time. I feel sorry for them. You don't tell them you feel sorry for them, but you say to yourself, I feel sorry for you because they didn't accept the gospel. But you gave it to them. You did all you could do. Now in chapter 10, we get to the representatives of the king. And he's going to uh, talk more to the disciples. And he's going to bring out the disciples more because he needs some helpers. What he's telling them by saying there needs to be workers in the harvest, he's saying, I need to, you. Look, what he's saying is, look at all these people out here. They all need the gospel. Even though I'm the son of God, I can't do it all on my own. I need your help. I need you to help me. Humility from the Son of God. And so he calls his 12 disciples and he calls them to be apostles eventually. And then in chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Jesus called his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits so they could cast them out and heal every kind of disease and sickness. So they received this not to focus attention on themselves, but to focus attention on Christ. Today, when we see faith healers, what are they doing? They're focusing attention on themselves. Oh, they might get up and they might say, in the name of Jesus, and bop somebody on the head. Or they might say, Jesus this and Jesus that. But they're bringing attention to themselves, and you know that by how much they fill up their wallets with money. And they do it for a profit, and they're disgusting. They are workers for Satan, not for Jesus. 
There is no gift of healing today. We know that. And these people are frauds. And when they get up, they bring attention to themselves. If they weren't bringing attention to themselves, then they wouldn't fill up stadiums like the Charlotte Stadium or the one down in Atlanta or anywhere they go. They fill them up. And idiots and nitwits come out to listen and watch them uh, heal people. Well, if they are healing people, it's of the devil. It's not of them. And they are not focusing anything on Christ because they never give the gospel. I've watched some of these things. And I've often said to myself while I'm watching it, I wonder if this man who's bopping people on the head ignorantly, or even if he's under the uh, influence of demons, he definitely is under the influence, maybe even the possession. I wonder if this person will ever give the gospel. They never have, not so long as I've watched them. They've said Jesus this and Jesus that, but they've never given the gospel. So he gave them these things, not to focus attention on themselves, but to focus attention on Christ. So, uh, so when they would go out, they would say, uh, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, believe in him. And then a, a sick person would come up and say, I believe in Christ, and bloop, they would heal them. And that was part of showing the fact that Jesus Christ was truly the Messiah. And that is how they functioned. Now we have 10-2. Now these are the names of the 12 apostles. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, called Peter. Peter's one of my favorites. And Andrew, his brother. James, son of Zebedee. And John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now, we see a listing here of Judas Iscariot as an apostle, and this has caused confusion as of late. And that's because, well, it's a no different than saying, well, any... Let's say we have a 5,000 member church and they all join up to be members. That doesn't mean all of them are saved. There, of course, are a lot of people in churches who've never been saved. And they never accepted the gospel. They just hitch on to something because they like the social life or they hitch on to something because uh, they might think they have some money involved in it. Well, this would be the way Judas Iscariot would think. Judas Iscariot, as an unbeliever, hitched on to the ministry of Christ, not because he was interested in the gospel, but because he was interested in making money. This man had a problem with money lust as an unbeliever. Believers can have it too, but he had it as an unbeliever. And he hitched on to that ministry thinking there was a lot of money involved because he saw all the throngs of people around Jesus and said, man, I'm going to get a lot of money for this. And we note that later because of what he said to the woman who was pouring expensive oil on our Lord's feet. He said, oh, we could have given that to the poor. What he was really thinking is, oh, you could have given that to me. You know, I could go out and spend that money better than pouring it on the Lord's feet. What a waste is what he was thinking. And he never, ever, not through all Matthew, ever addressed Jesus Christ as Lord. He always said, Rabbi, which is teacher. It would be an insult to call our Lord teacher or rabbi. He wasn't like all the other rabbis. He was the son of God. And Peter would call him son of God. And the, 11, and the 10 others, including Peter, would call him son of God. But Judas Iscariot always would say, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi. Never once said that. So why is he included as part of the 12? It's by name only. You could be an unbeliever, join a church by name only, and still be unsaved. And this is what occurred here. And this is why Matthew brings out the fact that Judas Iscariot, who, by the way, betrayed him, if he was a believer, guess what? If he was a believer, who betrayed him wouldn't have been put in there. You know why? That would be judging. And guess what? You can't judge other believers. And you say, can you judge an unbeliever? Well, the fact is, yes. The fact is, yes. But we never judge anyone because we don't want, because we don't really know who's a believer or not. But Matthew goes ahead and says, who betrayed him? Because he knows he's an unbeliever. He would have never said that if Judas Iscariot had believed. Because guess what he could have said? Now, these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon called Peter, who betrayed Christ three times. And he did. 
He did betray him three times. He said, no, I don't know the Son of God. And then he got mad or somebody else came up and said, do you know this man? He says, no, I don't know him. And then the third time they got around to him, he was getting so frustrated, he cussed him out. He said, I don't know the so-and-so blankety blank blank. Cussed him out. Betrayed him three times and then the cock crowed. But Matthew doesn't talk about Peter because Peter was a believer. And he doesn't say Peter who betrayed Christ three times or who denied Christ, didn't really betray him, just denied him three times. So he brings out Judas Iscariot who betrayed him because he is the unbeliever of the group. Otherwise, he couldn't judge him. And there are lots of times in Scripture where they completely leave out names uh, because they don't want to uh, show the person because at the time of writing, you see, you, now after they're dead, they might throw in the name. But at the time of writing, these people might be alive. And they don't want to say anything about them while they're alive. And oftentimes they wouldn't mention some of the sins of the disciples even though they could make a point off of it. Because, well, they just, uh, they were alive and they didn't, they were following the royal family honor code and they weren't going to do that. They weren't going to gossip. So in 10.5, Jesus sent out these 12 instructing them as follows. Do not go to the Gentile regions and do not enter any Sumerian town. Is this because he didn't want the gospel taught there? No. It's because the message of the kingdom had to be offered first to the Jews. And this means that grace had to, be, had to come before judgment. You see, right now, the kingdom's being offered to Israel. They could accept it or reject it. And the fact is, if they had all believed in Christ, and if they had all gotten positive toward the Word of God, there would have been no church age, and we'd have went straight into millennium. And you say, how do you know that? Because it says in Romans, because of their unbelief, we've been given greater grace. Whose unbelief? The Jews. So now separated from the Jews is the church age. And that's why any pastor who gets up and tries to bring the tribulation into the church age or tries to say there are signs coming for the tribulation, he's a liar because this age is separated from the tribulation. And you say, but things are getting bad now. That's because there's not enough people listening to the Word of God. Things have gotten a lot worse in the past. In the Middle Ages, well, people lived to be about 30, 35 years old and dropped dead. And I remember studying uh, Mozart in music class. And the teacher would get up and make the point, my, he died awful young. No, they were all dying about 30, 35, and he was one of them. And that's the way it was because there wasn't a lot of positive volition. And blessing comes a lot along with positive volition. So he names these disciples and names the twelve apostles, but it's in name only for Judas Iscariot. It's in reality for the other eleven. So he says, go instead to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Grace before judgment. Go to Israel first. They're the client nation. Present to them the gospel. Present to them the fact that I'm the son of God. Go to them first. And they did, but they rejected it. And so in August of 70 AD, they went under the fifth cycle of discipline. 10.7, as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven that is promised is actually part of the four unconditional covenants to the Jews. And this has to do with the kingdom of eternal life through faith alone in Christ alone. So this kingdom that is promised is part of the unconditional covenants. Faith alone in Christ alone, you'll go to heaven. And that was part of the unconditional covenants for them. It's an unconditional covenant for us as well. If we believe in Christ, we're going to heaven. Go instead to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is here. <coughs> then in 10.6, by the way, I just coughed. I went out to a uh, supper or a late supper last night with uh, someone and uh, I started to cough and the man said, are you about to preach now? <laughs> That's because every time I get up here, I start, cough, start coughing. I thought it was quite humorous. Then in uh, 10, uh, where were we now? 10.7, as you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is here. 10.8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, and cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. 
They will re freely receive the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. This will occur on the day of Pentecost, and as they've received that gift, they should surely uh, utilize that gift. In other words, uh, don't, uh, don't forsake your gift. And then he goes on to tell them their mode. How sh their modus operandi, actually, in 10.9. What is their modus operandi? How should they function now that they are going to be apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ? 10.9. Do not take money or wallet. Doesn't mean, it doesn't mean don't take someone else's money or wallet, even though they shouldn't do that either, but what, not unless it's offered to them. But what it's saying is don't take your own money. Don't take your own wallet. Don't take two coats. You see, it got cold in Israel every now and then. They probably get about as much snow as we do here in Anderson. And it does get a little chilly in the winter. And they would say, don't even take your coats. Don't, don't even bother taking extra sandals or staff. For the worker is worthy of his provision. Well, what the Lord is doing is he's saying, look, you better go out. When you go out and teach, you better go with a relaxed mental attitude and you better not be worried about the details of life because if you're worried about the details of life, you'll not be a good communicator of doctrine. You always have, someone will always put your thumb on you and they'll say, I'm the one with the money. I have the authority over you. And what Jesus is saying, don't you do that. What you need to do is just go out. And don't even worry about money. Heck, don't even take your wallet. Don't even take extra sandals. Go as you are. Go just with the clothes on your back and go. And if people are positive, they'll provide for you. If they're negative, they want, so move on and go somewhere else. And this is definitely going to come out. And he's telling them, he's preparing them right off for the ministry, straight off, because of most ministers don't make it too well financially. And so what he's doing is he's preparing them, saying, look, you better, if you have any thought, any worry about money, any anxiety about money, any anxiety about the provisions of life and logistical grace support, you're not even qualified to go teach. That's what he's saying. And he's saying, if, you go with these thoughts on your mind. Somebody's going to put their thumb over you and, and you're going to, well, you're not going to be able to fulfill your mission because they will say, I've done this and this for you. And what they say is, go to hell. You should have been doing that anyway because that was part of their ministry. So they will be sustained by those believers who find it necessary to give freely of their own substance, to give freely, no strings attached. This also indicates that they, as the disciples, must use faith rest. And they must realize that God will provide, and God will provide people who will also freely, freely give to them with no strings attached. And so they, he says, don't even worry about the extra cost of a sandal or a staff. Just walk out. Just look. What he's saying is, I have appointed you as apostles. You get up and you do what I say and you go out into the world. And if people want to give to you, stay there and preach. If they don't, move on somewhere else and preach. But I've appointed you with a spiritual gift and you will fulfill it. And despite what people do, despite what anyone else does. And then he gives them a protocol to follow of how they should act. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy there and stay with them until you leave. Find out who is worthy means, well, they'll find out who is positive toward the word. They'll find out who are the people there who want to listen to the word and who want to accept it. They, in fact, will ask you to stay, that is, if they're positive. And if there's no positive, positive volition in the area for them as apostles and as evangelists going around, it will be self-evident. Because no one will give them a cold glass of water. No one will feed them. No one will house them. So what they will do is just move on to the next city and they'll find someone else who's positive who will be willing to uh, help them out for a few days until they have to move on again. Now, apostleship is different from pastor-teacher. Pastor-teachers uh, usually end up staying in one place, not usually today, but they usually stay in one place where their flock is and, 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 and until they're not needed, and then they may have to go somewhere else. But uh, usually the way it works uh, for the pastor is he gets in one place and stays for a while, at least uh, and, and unless there's no positive volition. And then in that case, it's true. They have to move on. 
but sometimes there's none anywhere, so they have to move on to a different profession. So, and then in uh, 10, 12, it says, when you enter the house, relax and enjoy the hospitality. When you enter the house, relax and enjoy the hospitality. What happens here, or hospitality, however you want to say it, it's probably hospitality. So, what he's saying here is, when you, when you go there, you'll find people who are positive toward doctrine. And he's not telling them, go into the city and beg. He's not saying, go into the city and say, I need food, water, and housing. Who's going who's gonna to come and give me food, water, and housing? He's not saying that. He's saying, you'll go there, you'll give the gospel, you'll give Bible doctrine. Someone will recognize it and say, hey, come over to my house tonight. I'll give you a hot meal, something to eat, and you can stay here until it's time for you to move on. And what does our Lord say about it? Does he tell them to uh, get on their knees and start thanking them profusely? No. Although they could say thank you would be uh, natural and part of protocol. But what he says is relax. Relax. They're doing it for a reason. It's reciprocity. You're giving them the gospel and doctrine, and they're giving you housing, shelter, clothing, food, whatever you need. And what he's saying is relax. You give them doctrine, they give you the means to preach it. And just relax in it. Don't even worry about it. And that's why he tells them to relax. Because one thing that any pastor and evangelist always faces is, I just can't make enough money here. I've got to do something else. No, relax. If, it's, if people are positive, they'll provi provide. Now, and then you say, well, the funds are gone. Well, it doesn't mean they were all negative. It just means it was time to close up. Maybe there was no purpose in it. And that's not an insult to anyone. If, it, this, if this church ever closed up, it wouldn't be an insult to any of you because sometimes we just don't have the means. And that's a, an effective way for God to shut the door. But it's nothing to worry about, see? And if the funds are gone, they're gone. If they're here, they're here, and we'll just keep going. Now, I'm not begging for money. I'm doing all right, by the way. So don't, uh, don't worry about that and don't think i got to dig into my wallet and put a whole bunch in that little pla or whatever box, box, that cardboard box that is. Don't think that. I'm doing just fine, and I'll be fine as long as the Lord wants me to do fine. And you give on your own free will, and, and, and you give with no strings attached, and I take with no strings attached. And that's just the way it goes. So then in um, 2.13, And if the house is worthy, let your blessings come on it. But if it is not worthy, move on. In other words, if those people are positive toward the word, stay there. If they're negative, get the hell out. Why would you want to hang around people who are going to be critical anyway? and who are going to try to hold their thumb over you or do whatever they need to do. Well, he's saying if they're positive, stay. If they're negative, get out. And then in 10.14, And whoever will not welcome you or listen to your message, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or that town. Now, this is uh, something that we have to get from ancient history. The dust from a heathen country was unclean. And uh, if you were, if you had been through a heathen country as a uh, as a, a person in Israel, and you had walked through that heathen country, maybe you went to the heathen country to do business. And there wasn't nothing wrong with it per se, but you had walked onto their soil. And by the Mosaic law, if you come back to your own land, you can't uh, give a sacrifice for a while until you've shaken the dust off your feet and until you have uh, done all of that because it was a heathen, unclean country. And, it, and they didn't do this out of submysticism. This was a way to teach doctrine, to say, Look, Israel, you're set apart. You're not like those other countries. You're different. And there are all types of uh, moans and groans in this country that we want to go like our motherland did before England. They went toward socialism. Guess what? They have socialized medicine. And now a lot of people in this country see the high bills of medical cost. I've seen them firsthand. And they say the government should pay for that. We're going the same way of our motherland, yet we're set apart. We don't need that junk. Rest in the Lord. He'll provide. We don't need government support for everything. Well, this country was founded on hard work, a hard work ethic. And if you ended up getting sick and couldn't pay for it, you died. But it made us a tough country. And we didn't ask Uncle Sam for everything. 
And every time we went into poverty, we didn't say, Uncle Sam, get me out. Now, I know there's laws today, and this isn't pointed toward anyone here. There are laws today that were put into effect a long time ago concerning bankruptcy and everything else, and those are legitimate because those banking institutions know the risk when they lend you the money. And this is already put into our laws. This is already there. And so when you go to a bank and you pay a certain interest rate, you're paying that interest rate because they have known in advance that there's a risk to loaning money. So it's part of our laws. I see nothing wrong with bankruptcy because it's part of our laws. I absolutely see nothing wrong with it. They know going into it. And you say, well, some people use that as an excuse. So what? That's their problem. Some people don't. Some people really need it. And back in England, they had, well, they would send you to jail if you couldn't pay anything back. Now, what good is that? They could have been a law-abiding citizen, end up in jail, and they can't even pay anybody back, anything. Well, there's no, there's no real... You see, and they had a grace system set up in Israel as well. Every 70 years... And all the property would go back to the original owner. It represented grace. So we can look at bankruptcy in our country as a simple grace law. So, and I know Jews, I, there's a Jew on the radio talking all about bankruptcy, how bad it is, etc., etc. And, uh, well, she's a Jew, and she wants to function uh, extraordinarily by the law. But these laws are set up in our country for a reason. And it's a grace law. I see no problem with it. So I, I say that because uh, I know a lot of people going through problems and have to do things like that. And I say that because I didn't want you to uh, get upset and think that I was pointing it out at you. I wasn't. So when you enter the house, relax and enjoy the hospita hospitality. And if the house is worthy, let your blessings come on it. But if it is not, move on. And whoever will not welcome you or listen to your message, shake off the dust from your feet. This would be the dust from a heathen country was unclean, and it caused defilement as is covered in the Mosaic law. Therefore, when you shake off the feet, when you shake your feet and you do like that and you shake the dust off, this was an indication of a cursing. And they would, uh, by doing this, you will curse the household or the people who reject you. Now, this was for the disciples. That doesn't mean we can get all arrogant and just uh, every time somebody says something we don't like, we shake the, our feet and say, <laughs> curse you. No, it's not the same as it is then. Uh, but then they could do that. And our Lord's telling them, look, when you leave that house and if they've rejected you, shake the dust off your feet and that will represent a cursing and he will fulfill that cursing in August of 70 AD because they had to do that many times. Heck, Peter was beat up so much, so was the Apostle Paul and all the others, beat up all the time because they would present the gospel. I tell you uh, the truth. It was more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah then it will be on the jet day of judgment for that town. Now, one pastor has said before, I won't tell you who, I mean, he's a good pastor otherwise, but he said, this must mean there are degrees of hell. This must mean that uh, some people, like uh, uh, the religious people, they must go to hell and really burn, while the others, like in Sodom and Gomorrah, they just burn a little bit. Or not, he didn't say a little bit, but he just, well, he got it all confused. This is called, this is temporal. In other words, it is better for people in Sodom and Gomorrah in their temporal judgment. It is better for them seeing, you see what happened actually in Sodom and Gomorrah, and you hear about uh, Lot's wife being turned into salt. When she turned around, guess what? She didn't really just automatically turn into a form of salt like herself as they show in the movies and you might think that and I understand why they show it all the time and I used to think it for the longest time that she turned around and poof she was salt and she froze just like this I thought that for the longest time until I heard otherwise what really happened was they had to book you know, the Lord was saying get out of there don't look back they had to get moving and when she had to turn around, she had to slow down. You can't run as fast when you are turning around. So she slowed down and turned around, and there was fire and brimstone coming up from the earth. And so what happened was it fell on her. And that's what uh, turned her into salt. 
all this fire and brimstone fell on her and killed her, crushed her. And yet Lot and all the others were still going full blast straight ahead. So they weren't affected. And that's exactly what happened there. But that was temporal judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah for being a bunch of homosexual unbelievers. It was a judgment on homosexuality. God does not permit homosexuality. He likes the divine establishment and the divine institution of family and of marriage. It's not Adam and Steve, it's Adam and Eve, and that's the way God made it. But Sodom and Gomorrah, they were all, uh, well, they liked uh, sex with uh, the same you know, male, male, female, female, and that's the way they did it. And they were destroyed for it, but that was temporal destruction. And he wasn't talking about the eternal judgment in which those people who were unbelievers in Sodom and Gomorrah will receive the same eternal judgment as the religious people. What our Lord is doing here is using comparison and contrast. He's saying, you always have learned in your Sunday schools, as it were, Sodom and Gomorrah fell all apart because of homosexuality. And that's true. But I tell you the truth, unbelievers. Your judgment's going to be worse than theirs. In other words, you're going to hell. And that temporal judgment is nothing compared to an eternity in hell if you don't wake up. So we see how tough our Lord is doing, our Lord is being, and we see how tough he is in actually uh, making a comparison and contrast in saying uh, they always knew Sodom and Gomorrah was a terrible place. And what our Lord is saying you're going to hell. You talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, you're all going to hell because you've rejected me. So he was tough with them. They hated him and they hung him on a cross. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things so that we might grow in grace and in knowledge so that we might come to fulfill the very purpose for which we are put here on the earth which is to glorify you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.